سمي العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد الله صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائه مجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين What is the problem with Islam? Or rather, what is the problem with the Muslims? What is the problem with the state of the Islamic world? Why is it, for example, when we enter an Islamic country, we don't see the Islamic principles? And when we leave the Islamic country and go to the foreign lands, we see the Islamic principles in place. True to the words of of the scholars, it is said that it was Jamal al-Din al-Afghani who said that I went to the west and I saw Islam but I didn't see any Muslims. And I came back to the east and I saw Muslims but I didn't see any Islam. Why is it, for example, that if I go to the freest Arab country, the one that is known to be the most democratic, like Lebanon, and I don't see a single muhajjiba, I don't see a single hijabi, working for example in a governmental role however i come to australia a country that claims to be based on judeo-christian morals or values and sometimes claims to be an atheist nation as our prime minister is today and yet you see in governmental roles women that are wearing hijab why is it for example when we go to the hajj we leave our countries we leave the clean streets of Sydney and we go to the Hajj and wherever we walk, what do we see? Trash everywhere. Rubbish. There's no such thing as a line. If you're going to stand, there's no such thing as a queue. You have to stand in a group to be able to get what it is that you want. This is the way that it is. That you have to stand there and shout out and be ruder than the other person to be able to achieve or gain the thing that you need. You have to be wise with your words. You have to throw in a bribe or two to get your things done. Why is this the case? Obviously, the Islamic principles do not preach this. However, the Muslims have tended to fall to their whims. They've tended to fall to their desires, and this is the way that they enact. This is the way that they conduct themselves. We see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite wisdom has created a universal formula. And this universal formula is in the form of the tyrannical empire or the evil empire. We see that all the time there is a tyrannical or evil empire that tries to, to rule and enslave everybody else. It exploits the weak, it rapes countries of their resources, and this is the same thing that we see today. This is a universal formula that has obviously been placed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He has created you لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيَّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا That I've created you to see who of you is the best of doers. And the only way to achieve this is to be placed in a certain state. And in this certain state, based on how you act, this will, say, this will show who is the best of doers and who is the worst of doers. Depending on what situation we're placed in. Even to this day, we see, for example, in the field of psychology, they attempt psychological experiments to try and find out the reality of the human being or what the human being is really thinking. And yet they have to go through so many intricate details to make sure that the person that's being tested is being tested in a proper manner. They have to put proper control measures to make sure they get the correct result and not a doctored result. Now, of these things that they do, of these control measures, uh, for example, there's a famous experiment where they get uh, 12 people to act as prison guards and 12 people to act as prisoners. And the prison guards have to treat the prisoners, they have to tell them to follow the rules, and they're allowed to use whatever force they, they, they want. And so it starts off as a bit of a joke and then it gets very serious. The people that are acting as prison guards begin to punish the people that are acting as prisoners. They begin to harm and torture them and it's a, re it's a very long study if you'd like to read it, it's very interesting. However, what ends up happening is the actual study isn't on this scenario, but the study is on the mentality of the people that are playing prison guards. And yet they don't know this. Because usually what they do is they get psycho psychology students to play that role. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the inner workings of mankind. 
There's no need to create this sort of scenario to find out exactly what the actions of this person will be. Like salam wa There's no need to place this scenario or to fool someone. No, the scenario is clear. The scenario is clear that there is good and there is bad. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدْ طَبَيْنَ الرُّشْتُ مِنَ الْغَيْ That falsehood is true from what is correct and what is true. So we see today that the Islamic world is in the strangest, strangest uh, place. It is in such a strange time that we don't see anything, not even the remnants of Islam being practiced. Anywhere you go to any Islamic country and ask anybody what is the treatment of the people, how do they treat other Muslims? They don't know if you're Shia yet, they don't know if you're Sunni, they don't know anything. But just the way that they treat you, they're all, for example, on a power trip. And then they have their rules and, and regulations. And these rules and regulations are all against minorities. That even to, uh, to my disdain, I saw, saw of my brothers, when we went to Hajj, of my brothers, we would be walking and we would see someone, for example, that is black. Someone that, that is uh, like African, black African. And they would look and say, oh my God, imagine how many diseases that guy has. Why is that guy physically diseased? Is it because he is black? Is that what makes him diseased? And why are you not physically diseased? How do you know you're not the one that's carrying the d diseases that bring him in there? We see that when the British Empire colonized the different nations, they killed off half of the people just from disease, from the diseases that they brought. And yet they televise to us and they inform us that no, it's these colored people that bring in the disease. It's the people that aren't our color. It's the people that are not our creed. Is this what Islam taught? Is th didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us, Inna akramakum Allah atqaqum. The most honorable in the eyes of Allah is the most pious among you. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches. This is what the Holy Prophet taught. Do you think, and I reiterate this all the time, that the Holy Prophet went around with a sword to make people turn to Islam? No. La ikraha fid deen. That there is no compulsion in religion. Religion is something that you have to decide to do and you have to follow. And if you don't, inna Allah ghaniyun an alameen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is needless of all the people. Kul tu'minu aw la. Kul aminu aw la tu'minu. He says, Allah SWT says, believe or do not believe. It's up to you. It's not something that he's forcing you to do. No. But if you believe, there's paradise. And if you disbelieve, there's the fire of hell. However, when we look at the state of Islam and us as Muslims, because this is our true identity. People come up and say, well, what's your identity? You go overseas, you tell them, I'm, I'm, for example, I'm Arabic or I'm Iraqi or I'm whatever. And they say to you, no, you're not. You're Australian. You came from Australia. And in Australia, they, when they ask you, well, what's your background? Why are you asking me what my background is? I speak the language better than you. I can play the accent better than you play the accent. But yet they still ask you, what is your nationality? Our true nationality is Muslim. This is our true identity. We are Muslims. And yet we're foregoing this identity. Why? These are the issues that we have with Islam, the problems that we have with Islam, uh, uh, with, with, sorry, with Muslims. Because Islam as a core religion and ideology is, uh, is, is obviously good and it's beneficial. And it has no issues in its core doctrine. However, the issues are within the Muslims themselves. What are the, the issues that the Muslims have? First and foremost, we have this inferiority complex. Inferiority complex is when somebody always feels lesser than, thus the word inferior. We feel lesser than the people around us and therefore... To try and make ourselves like the people around us, so we can feel like these superior beings that they claim to be, we try and emulate them. This is one of the biggest problems that we have, or one of the biggest challenges. For example, you notice that some people, they feel embarrassed to walk next to a hijabi, for example. Or some people feel embarrassed to wear Arab attire, wherever they go. Therefore, they try and dress up like the uh, proverbial evil empire, like the authority that, that, that is, for example, like the British Empire, or whoever it may be that is the authority at hand, they try and emulate them to be away from their original culture because they feel that their original culture is the source of all their problems and their issues. This is the inferiority complex, or what is also known in psychological lingo as the cultural cringe. That we cringe from our own culture. In fact, the reasons behind this, why we have why this phenomenon exists is because when we sit there and we obey whatever it is 
our masters tell us, and when I say by our masters, obviously I use it in a, in a sardonic manner, that whatever it is they tell us, we believe them. They tell us that the white man is superior, we believe them. They tell us, for example, the might of the, the United States military, we believe them. We believe in all of these things and then they, they bombard us with it through mass media, through the internet, through television. They bombard us with these images to make us feel completely inferior. That in fact, uh, one of the key examples that they use uh, for this inferiority complex is that of, for example, Australian academics or Australian artists or poets, the likes of Henry Lawson, who in his books that he wrote, in one of his books he writes about how he felt inferior because they would compare him to a British scholar. So they'd say this is the Australian Kipling. He said, why should I be compared to a British scholar when I have made myself an Australian? I'm an Australian poet, I'm an Australian author. So he wanted to be recognized. The reason I'm using this is to show you that it's beyond not just Islamic, no. But we fall under that trap, so what do we do? Based on whatever the mass media teaches us, we follow. They give us preconceived ideas of piety and faith, we obey. They give us preconceived notions of love and relationships, we obey. Preconceived notions of how we should dress, and we obey. We follow all these things that we begin to lose the naming, for example, of ourselves and our children. We're afraid to call ourselves Ali and Hassan and Hussein and Muhammad, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And so what we try and do, we try and cover ourselves up, we try and hide. What's a good name? What's a name, for example, that sounds good for in our culture and their culture? And this is what we'll select. God forbid we'll call the name Osama, for example. Or call the name, uh, uh, and this is the name of a companion of the Holy Prophet. Or God forbid we'll call the name Abdullah or Abdul Rasul, etc. We wouldn't call that name. Why? Because we are afraid to call that name. And we try and change our names. For example, if someone's called Fatima, she'll go and call herself Fufu. If someone's called Fadi, he'll call himself Fufu. Why? So nobody calls him that name. So he hides from his culture. Oh, this is my name. It's and sometimes they use horrendous names. Horrendous names that have nothing to do with their original name. For example, someone called Ali will call himself James. So this is my name. My name is James. Why? So he can fit in. That he f this, is the, this is the way that this inferiority, inferiority complex damages us. What we need to do, obviously is restore our identity. We need to take back our identity. Be proud of your name. Be proud of who you are, of your culture, of your religion. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, عظم الخالق عندك يصغر المخلوق في عينك. That if you عظم الخالق, if you, if you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as great, you will see the creation as small. Now obviously Islam is about humility. It's about being humble. And all of our prophets taught this and, and actually were this. This is what they were. They were humble. And all of our imams were humble. They had such great humility. However, when you see the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then all other creations become small in your eye. So therefore you don't fear or don't feel inferior to the other person. Why? Because of the color of his skin is different to you. Or feel inferior, why? Because this is what they show as the norm on television. So this is the first key and core issue that we face as, uh, as, as a serious problem to Muslims. The second is the fact that Islam has a very high level of morals. And therefore when we see these uh, degraded mor morals and decayed morals, we automatically see it. Why? Because there is a great contrast. Because the Islamic morals are so high and so great that when we take on their morals, all of a sudden, and they have no morals, the morals that they, that, that they come up with. And when I say they, anyone that is outside the realm of Islam. That they have some good factors here and there. However, outside the real realm of Islam, they lose these morals. Why? They don't have this way of life. And this is the great contrast that we see. And the first and foremost of the people who lose the Islamic morals are the Muslims. This is the problem. The fact that we are the first and we become worse than they become. We become worse than they become. You know, when, for example, when a Muslim leaves Islam and he wants to be so much like the Westerner, how does he become? He becomes more Western than the Westerner to a degree that's shocking. You see, for example, all right, for ex the, the, the woman. The, what, what is the beauty of a woman? What is the beauty of a person? Imam Ali alayhi salam says the beauty of a person is in their aql, in their intellect, in their brain. This is the true beauty. 
When people, for example, go and look for a wife or a spouse, they want the most attractive thing that they can find. This is problematic. The true beauty is in somebody's intellect. This is what makes somebody beautiful. I mean, take a look at yourselves. How do you select your friends? Do you select your friends on physical beauty? Or do you select them on intellect? Or do you select them on good morals, good conduct? Isn't this how you should select your life partner, your spouse, the one who would live with you and be with you for the rest of your life? It's all based on intellect. However, what do we do? What do we do? We do the exact opposite. We see, for example, our women who wear hijab. When it comes time, and this is for the sisters, when it comes time to, for a wedding or something like that, they overdress. They absolutely overdress. They dress worse than a woman of the street would dress. Why? Is this what shows your beauty to the other women? No. The beauty of a woman is in her affa, her modesty. Her modesty is what makes a woman beautiful. It's her modesty and her intellect. These are the most beautiful things about a woman. This is something that we need to understand. Take back these Islamic morals. Take back our Islamic identity because this identity is above and beyond any other identity we carry. That's not about my passport or the name on the passport or what country I'm a citizen of. To the degree that if you think about it, when you travel to the Arab lands, if you speak Arabic, you're treated worse than somebody who doesn't speak Arabic. Why? Because oh, this guy's English or this guy's American. We better look after him. Because why? Because when we watch American television programs, if a dog goes missing, they send out helicopters to find him. But when we see in the Arab lands, 11 people go missing and they forget about them. They get on with their daily lives. And even though they're kidnapped and they're held for ransom, for example, this is the way it is. And so we accept it that, uh, that a white man is more valued than any other colored person. And this is why, for example, whenever you fly on a plane, an Emirates plane or something, you never fear it's going to be hijacked. Because Muslims aren't going to hijack a Muslim plane. No one's going to care about it. This is why the only planes that get hijacked or terrorized are usually planes that are owned by Western nations. Now, I know it's something that sounds comical, but this is the truth. Why? Because we have this in our heads, that these people have more value than us. Even when, for example, they'll, they'll create a film or anything about foreigners or even on, on, uh, on, the, um, on the news, when you speak about a battle and soldiers dying, if soldiers from the alliance die, for example, soldiers from the Australian army or the British army or the American army, they lose their lives. But when terrorists die, terrorists get destroyed or terrorists get killed. And a terrorist could be anyone. A terrorist could be someone attending a funeral, as we've seen throughout the media. However, without going too far into this, this is one of the things that is a problem with Islam. Thirdly, the most important one, is the effects of mass media. This is something that's really important, and I don't want to go into too much detail about mass media, but it's as simple as your television. We've come to a time where we can't live without our television. We enter the house, we turn it on. We leave it on 24-7, whatever's happening in the background. And now imagine, for example, seriously take this as an example, and unfortunately we have to use extreme examples to enliven ourselves. Imagine Imam al-Hujjah al sharif was going to come to your house. Would you turn the television on? Seriously. Have a look at what programs are out there. Have a look at what advertising is on. What we're showing ourselves and our children. This is what their notion, this is, you're building up their mentality and their biases. From such a young age, this is what they're learning. Whatever it is that they show on the TV. That, for example, the Westerner is superior to the Muslim. And Islamic knowledge is inferior. Islamic knowledge is always alternative knowledge. If you talk about anything, Chinese medicine, Chinese medicine is alternative mes medicine. Why? The only real medicine is the medicine that comes from the Western nations. That they say, we sit there, we know how to experiment properly, we know how to do everything. And you go and have a look. Go and have a look at how many problems they've come up with. Go and research the correlation between the companies that make nappies for men and the research they put into prostate cancer. They start telling you, you need to get checked, you need to get checked. So the doctor goes and checks you for prostate cancer and it's one of the most gruesome checks that you can get. And sometimes it's not even a cancer, they just uh, feel that there's a growth. They say, oh, we're going to have to remove that growth. Once they remove that growth, for about a period of three to six months, you're going to be on nappies. The, ma the male has to wear nappies. So the company, s uh, people like uh, Johnson & Johnson and uh, uh, Clark, whatever the, uh, that other company is called, they... Invest money into this research. Why? So they can send, sell more of these male nappies. This is true. Go and have a look. And this isn't the only one. Go and look at how many of uh, other pharmaceutical firms research certain things. They enforce them upon the people. And so the people are doing these unnecessary tests, unnecessary surgery. Why? So they can keep their med medicine sales up. 
Notice that the way the doctors prescribe anything, why this counts as their knowledge. However, when you throw it as Islamic knowledge, they look at it as, oh, this is alternative. And it's so deep in our heads. I'll tell you why it's so deep in our heads. Because when we say that the Holy Prophet, for example, says, don't do this. The Holy Prophet says, have a pinch of salt before and after you eat. One of the key things that the Holy Prophet says is to brush our teeth. At every time, at every uh, at time of prayer, we need to brush our teeth. Do Muslims have the best dental record in history? No, they don't. Why? Because they don't follow what the Prophet says, but when they hear it from a medical study or they read something in the newspaper or on the news, they say, oh, it must be real, and the Holy Prophet said it. They never take it as the Holy Prophet said it, we accept it. Why? Because it's alternative. This is what they teach us when we, when, when we go into our universities, when we go into our tertiary education. This is what we're learning. We're learning that it's true and correct. Why? Because Sir Isaac Newton said it. This is the true model of the atom. Why? Because Rutherford said it. This is the true table of elements. Why? Because so-and-so said it. Medlev said it. That once they say it, this is true and correct, that's it. And this is what we have to base it on. Their theories, however far out, are true and correct. However, when we hear something from our prophets or our imams, we don't accept it. We hear something from the Holy Quran, we don't accept it. These are the problems with the Muslims, my friends, today. These are the problems with us. We need to, from now, from this moment, start. That usually in Ashura, for example, People that listen to music stop listening to music for 10 days. Fantastic. Let's make it go longer than 10 days. The television should be off in your house. It's like a time of mourning. So if it stays off in your house, try and use that as a stepping stone that I'm not going to watch as much mass media. I can't, obviously, I'm, I'm not telling you to, to obliterate or cut the free to air TV. However, I wish I could say that. But we live in a, in a day and age where I know people are going to sit there and say, oh, it's too hard. I can't do it. I need to watch the news. The news, the news. It's full of professional liars. Seriously, have you watched the news lately? Have you watched what the headlines are? The biggest garbage. If so-and-so model tries on a new dress, that's a headline. If somebody tweets something, that's a headline. Go look at what the headlines are. There's people dying, people starving, people burning, and it means nothing. None of these things make the headline. Unless it's for the people who are paying. The people who are paying for these professional lies to do their jobs. That's all it is. It's just a massive tool of marketing. That's all the television is. So we turn it off for 10 days, inshallah. Let's try and maintain it. Let's try and keep it up. This is the way we restore our identity. Go buy our Arabic names. Dress in our Arabic dress. Be proud of it. Why? What makes their dress better than our dress? What makes pants better than, for example, a thobe? What makes it better? Why can't I wear whatever it is that I want to wear? Who's stopping you? In this country, alhamdulillah, nobody is stopping you. Don't let these feelings of in inferiority overtake you. This is the first thing that we need to look at. The second thing is obviously what is the source of all of this aberration? What is the source of these problems in the Islamic Ummah? Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The source of this aberration, the source of this aberration and the source of these problems First and foremost comes from the time of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is important. The source is Raziyatul Khamis. You need to look up this. Now people sit there and they say, hold on a minute. Why is it that the world revolves around Islam and the Holy Prophet? So whenever a Muslim lecturer gets up and he sits there and he talks about Holy Prophet this and Holy Prophet that, the problems are wider than this. Well, inshallah tonight I'll prove to you that they're not wider than this, that in fact this is the source and these are the roots of all of our problems. Raziyat al-Khamis is the calamity of Thursday. What's the calamity of Thursday? We believe as Muslims, and I don't need to get into the details of the initial sources, that the Holy Prophet is khayra khalqillah. That he is the greatest creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the direct representative of Allah, and he is the purpose of all of our creation. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the whole creation for the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and this holy prophet, when he came down with the final message, what happened to him on his deathbed would never happen to anyone that we know. That this is something that is such a calamity that it's even remembered in the books of all of the Muslims. That they say on this Thursday, whenever they remember the Thursday, oh, what a Thursday. And they begin to cry and they begin to weep. That the holy prophet was on his deathbed and he asks them, he says to them, to the people that are around him, that I'm going to leave this world soon. 
Give me some writing materials. So there's different formulas of the hadith. But he says, give me writing materials. Give me a pen and a paper, a pen and a leather pad, something so I may write something for you. Kitaban lan tadullu ba'dahu abadan. That he says to them, I will write a writing for you that you will not. In the Arabic language, lan means absolutely never. That you will never, all right, fall into any form of misguidance. Lan tadullu ba'di. Abadan. That if you give me something, I will write something for you that you will never fall into misguidance. What does this mean? Imam Ali alayhi salam says, the difference between the truth and falsehood is four fingers. We've heard that all of the imams say, four fingers, and that's between what you've seen and what you've heard. We have another one that says the difference between truth and falsehood is intellect. That this is the core difference, the fact that I'm ignorant to the truth. Had I known the truth, I would work on the truth. This is the truth. If we know the truth, we would go by it. Otherwise, you would be foolish to not go by it. And so he says, I will write something for you that you will never be misguided after this ever. Take this piece of writing and you will never be misguided. So any form of misguidance after this is the fault of the people who stopped the Holy Prophet from writing this writing. So anyone that gets killed, it's the fault of that person. Anyone that gets lied to, it's the fault of that person. Anyone that gets a divorce, it's the fault of that person. We even have a narration of Imam al-Sadiq. He says that if two shells in the ocean hit into each other, it's the fault of this person. Who were these people? The people that were standing before the Prophet. And you, got, you have to look at the old Hadith books, the old Bukhari, the old Muslim, the old Tabari. Because the new prints, they've eliminated the names. They just say there were some men. Fine, let's agree that it was a group of men. These group of men that were standing before the Holy Prophet were obviously of the best Sahaba, otherwise they wouldn't have been there. And so these people that stood by the Prophet, they said that surely this man is in delirium. And then they all said, oh yes, he must be delirious. So the Holy Prophet wasallam says to them, leave, I am in a better state than what you say about me. Imagine that this is what they said about the Holy Prophet the one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, testifies in Surah Al-Najm. That he says that, وَمَا يَنْتَقْ عَنَ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not speak or act of his desire. Nay, it is a revelation that is revealed unto him. And this is what the Holy Prophet says that you turn around and say, that this man is in delirium. Or a state where that he is delirious. So people say, then why didn't the Holy Prophet just say it anyway? Why? Because this cursed man who said that the Prophet was in a state of delirium has set a precedent that anything that the Prophet says after this or writes after this will be considered as a state of delirium. Therefore, it would be a falsehood. So the Holy Prophet asks them to leave. And then in another narration, a few of them, they say that, yes, yes, I heard what the Holy Prophet said after this. His last words were, one, it, it, uh, exile all of the non-Muslims from the Arabian Peninsula. Two, he says, uh, and treat the foreign delegations in the same way as to treat them by giving them gifts. And I forgot the third one. Fancy that. This genius, not one of them, a couple of them. Remember the first two, but they forgot the third one. What was this important piece of information that we will never fall into any misguidance after? This is the core and the root of all of the problems. This usurpation of the position of Khalif, this is the core of all the problems. How do we say this? It's because obviously, and repeating myself from the beginning, that the Holy Prophet says, I will give you this piece of information that you will never ever go astray after. You will never fall into any aberration after you receive this final revelation. So, first and foremost, we look and we see that it is this disobedience of the Holy Prophet وسلم, that places the Muslims in this foul state. It's this issue where we see that the leaders of Islam, the, the, the people who claim to be the leaders of Islam, bow to every whim of the authorities that be. It's here that we see that the people who claim to be the kings of the Islamic lands and the servants of the Haramain, the two sanctuaries, the, the, the uh, mosque of the Holy Prophet and, and Mecca, they, they can sit down and have a champagne with foreign leaders. However, don't try and bring a book of dua into their country. Don't try and bring a piece of pure clay to prostrate on. These things are absolute no-nos. What sort of, what, what, what has the Islamic world fallen into? What has it become? How did the Holy Prophet وسلم, attract people to Islam? Was it not through his akhlaq? Was it not through his, his mannerisms? 
And his, his attitude towards people, isn't this what brought people to the religion of Islam even to this day? That they read and they hear the stories about the Holy Prophet wasallam, And this is what brings them towards Islam. And this thing has been absolutely taken away. This is the core of all the problems of the Islamic world. Furthermore, the Holy Prophet tells us, obviously, in Hadith al Thaqalain, in the many narrations of Hadith al Thaqalain, that he tells the people that I will leave you with two weighty things. That if you hold on to these, لن تظلوا بعدي أبدا. That if you hold on to these two weighty things in another narration, you will never, alaykum salam, you will never go astray, never fall into any aberration. You will never fall. Again, you will always be guided and, and maintain the righteous path. What are these two things? He says, Kitab Allah wa Atrati Ahl Bayt. He says, The Book of Allah and my Ahl al Bayt. These are the two most important things that the first thing the people did when the Prophet passed away is they dropped both of these things. And we see and read into the black history of Islam and what had become of it. Now we notice that this again is a formula. It's a precedent that we see all of the time. We see with every other prof prophet before our holy prophet that this is what happened. This same event was reenacted. The same event of the prophet dying and the people going astray. The people following their own whims. And that, this is what it comes down to. It becomes to what you're seeing today. The state of Islam today, imagine this, that, that someone has, has actually got the nerve to draw up plans, a Muslim, to draw up plans to demolish the grave of the Holy Prophet and expand the mosque. Why? Because as far as they're concerned, their level of knowledge they've reached, they have seen that the mosque of the Holy Prophet, the grave of the Holy Prophet is useless to Islam. That there's no point of having this grave. There's no point of admiring this. Imagine that, for example, we have the house of Sir Donald Bradman. It still, it still exists. It's here in, in Rockdale somewhere. That wherever he went to school, it still exists. And they keep it as a heritage listing. And this is what? A guy that used to play cricket. That's all he was. A guy that used to play cricket. Imagine our holy prophet that today, they have the nerve to stand up and draw these plans. And what does the Islamic Ummah do? Nothing. The nation of Islam sits on its hands. It says, oh my God, they're going to destroy the Prophet's grave. It's ridiculous that we see to this day how many of us are getting killed and harmed and tortured. And obviously, the blood of a Muslim is holier than these shrines. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the honor of a Muslim is greater than the honor of the Kaaba, for example. And yet we see this happening, we let it go. Of course, they're going to be able to destroy the Prophet's grave. Of course, they're going to be able to do whatever they want. And hang on, it's going to get worse. There's going to be more action. There's going to be more things that happen in Islam. Soon they'll allow homosexuality into, into Islam. Soon they'll allow everything, no matter what you can think of. And you know what? The people will remain idle. The people will just sit down and watch this happen because this is the state that they fell into by disobeying the Holy Prophet ﷺ, by not following his Ahlul Bayt, by not allowing him to give his final will and testament. And we see in the history of Islam from the first Khalif, imagine the first thing that he did was begin to kill the companions of the Prophet. This is what the first Khalif did. Go and have a look and read up about Malik bin Nuwayra and, and the, the, the slaughter that was under the sword of Khalid bin Walid. And then we see the second Khalif does worse. The third Khalif kills a companion, Abu Dhar. This companion, Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, was one of the most esteemed companions that imagine in the court of the Khalif, the Khalif comes down and stomps him on the floor. He stomps him until he, he, he causes him to have a hernia. And then he exiles him and he goes to die. Imagine that this is the greatest companion. And yet look, go and have a look what people are having issues with now. They're having problems. Oh my God, people do la'an of Sahaba. Allahu Akbar. This is a big issue. Sahaba have been killed and, and are dying. But oh my God, this is a serious problem. Oh my God, people are doing la'an of Aisha. Big problem. This is a huge issue. That this is what they're taking as important and great issues. How backwards is that? These other Ashab were actually killed. Imagine in the court of Islam, you're in the court of the Khalif of the Muslimin and you get stomped. This is what happened to Abu Dhar. And then he was exiled from Medina to the worst place and he died in that place. This is what happened. And then after this, the third Khalif invited his cousins to enter the realm of Islam. His cousins being the Umayyads. These people 
where the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam, when when the verse in the Quran was was revealed about a shajarat al malauna fil Quran, the tree that is cursed in the Holy Quran, it is said that during this time the Holy Prophet has a dream and he sees monkeys bouncing on his pulpit, and so. They come and they ask him, the Holy Prophet, what does this mean? He says that one day the Umayyads will mount the pulpit of Rasulullah. That these, these monkeys that were seen in the dream were the Umayyads, Banu, Banu Umayyad. And in fact, the Holy Prophet, Nabiul Rahma, that imagine the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we see that historians say that even though we hear about Imam Ali alayhi salam and the courage of Imam Ali alayhi salam in the battlefield is unmatched, absolutely, by any historian. However, Imam Ali alayhi salam himself says, that when the going used to get tough in battle, we used to shield behind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was, this was how great of a warrior Rasulullah is. However, we read that never did anyone get killed under the sword of Rasulullah because he was Nabi al-Rahmah. That some got maimed, some got injured, but nobody got killed under the sword of Rasulullah. That we see that this prophet of mercy then says that al-Hakam ibn al-As, and his son Marwan are exiled from the Arabian Peninsula. Never are they to enter the Arabian Peninsula again. He exiles these two people. Why? So when the third Khalif comes, the first thing he does is says, come back, welcome home. They come back and Marwan becomes, Ibn al-Hakam becomes his key and core advisor. Now you notice how the Islam is deteriorating so quickly. By the 50th year, after the demise of the Holy Prophet, or close to the 50th year, in the 45th year, we see that Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan takes power. This son of the most staunch enemy to Islam is now in the position of power. And you see that the governors around, and notice this, that Rasulullah non-stop, we look in the history as much as you want to look, and you will see that the whole time the Holy Prophet says that, أذكركم, أذكركم Allah. So many times he says it three times. That, that I remind you of my Ahlul Bayt and how you should be towards my Ahlul Bayt. That my Ahlul Bayt are the other heavy weights from the Hadith of Thaqalain. We have the Holy Quran and we have the Ahlul Bayt. My Ahlul Bayt, my Ahlul Bayt. And because of the lack of time, we can't mention all of the narrations. However, what do they do? That in the, in the realm, in, in the period, of the reign of the first Khalif and the second Khalif and the third Khalif, none of the Ahlul Bayt were, were, were even given the status of a police officer, nor an accountant, nor nothing. Nothing. And you see the people that were taken as governors, what sort of people were they? Go read up about the governor of Kufa, that Muawiyah gave him his position, and he stood up in the morning because obviously the governor, the emir of the area, he's the one that prays Jama'ah, so he stands up to pray Jama'ah in Salat al Fajr and he prays. Eight rak'at. And they say to him, Eight rak'at, this is fajr. He goes, What, do you want more? I'll give you a, a few more. Why? He was so drunk off his head, he didn't know what it was that he was praying. In another one, we see that one of them said he was too drunk to pray because they used to, what they used to do is actually fill fountains and ponds of wine. And when they used to have their massive orgies and parties, they used to drink this wine and get drunk. So this guy got so drunk that he said, I can't pray today. He took off his turban and he placed it on. The Christian slave girl that he had there, this obviously she was uh, the, one of the party girls, he puts the turban on her and he goes, you go lead the prayer. I'm too drunk to lead the prayer. This was the state of Islam that only four, 45 years after the demise of the Holy Prophet, this is what the state of Islam was. And then you have this guy, this epic gentleman by the name of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. This guy was somebody... He used to, to mock Islam. He had a monkey. And he called this monkey a name. He used to call the monkey in some narrations. He used to call it Abu Turab. So he used to he call this monkey this name to mock Amir al muminin And then when this monkey died, he says to the people, we need to wash this monkey, put a kafan on it, and we give, give it a proper Islamic burial. Imagine that. A man who used to sleep with dogs. A man who used to do the most, think of the most horrible crimes that you can imagine. This is what this man used to do. And he was the Khalif of the Muslimin. This guy was the person who was the link, according to them, according to the, the majority of the Muslims, the link to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine that. Fancy that. Crimes that you wouldn't even imagine. Crimes that you could not fathom. This is what this person was doing. People that were Ashab were getting killed. 
The media machine of the Umayyads was so big, the propaganda machine. I'll just give you a small story to show you the way that they used to uh, breed hatred for the Ahlul Bayt. And it's almost going to be the, the time for prayer. They used to breed hatred. One of the ways that they used to breed hatred for the Ahlul Bayt is uh, during the, uh, the reign of Muawiyah, he used to give camels to the, young, uh, to the young men. He'd say, he's a baby camel and you raise this camel. And young men like to have something to do. They like to have pets, for example. So they take this camel as a pet and they raise the pet and they feed it. And then when it becomes old enough, he would send his soldiers to steal the camel. Once they steal it, look at how clever Muawiyah was. That he gets them to raise the camel. Then, because the camel was, the, was the, obviously the, the staple animal of burden. That if you want to go to battle or you want to, you, you, if you're a merchant, you would put everything on the back of a camel. The ships of the desert they used to be known as. And so he would steal these camels and then use them. And imagine they've been raised for free. These people have been looking after them, feeding them everything. And then once he steals it, the people would come to the police and say, someone's stolen our camel. They'll say, Ali ibn Abi Talib stole your camel. So this kid will say, I hate Imam Ali alayhi salam. From when he's young, he would breed hatred to the extent that when the martyrdom of Imam Ali alayhi salam happened, and they asked, how did it happen? They said, while he was in prayer, and they were in shock. Imam Ali used to pray. They were shocked. This is the people of Syria were shocked that Amir al-Mu'mineen, who is the prayer. If, if, there, if there is prayer, Imam Ali is the prayer. If there's deen, if there's faith, Imam Ali is the faith. Alayhi salam. That this is who the faith is, and these people are wondering, oh, really, did he pray? How could he die in prayer when we, what we know of him is he never used to pray? This was the propaganda machine of the Umayyads today. The evil authority used the same propaganda machine against us. And this is the news that we watch on a daily basis. This is the TV that we let allow into our houses to manipulate our minds and our children's minds. And then when they grow older, we wonder why. Why doesn't my daughter want to get married? Why is she 19 years old and thinks that she's still young? Why doesn't my son want to get married, for example? He's 22 years old and he thinks he's still young. Or why is it that the parents instill this into them? That's another story altogether. However, that it is... This propaganda machine that pushes them to, towards that, which brings us to Abu Abdullah al Hussein. That we are back into the days of Ashura, the beginning days of Muharram. And in fact, I know that the majority of the Muslims say that Muharram is the first month of the cal Islamic calendar year. However, a lot of our scholars beg to differ and believe that Rajab is the first month. However, we've accepted Muharram to be the first month. So a lot of the other school of thought today will be greeting each other with Happy New Islamic Year, etc. But today the true followers of Islam are the ones that are in mourning, in commemoration of the eternal stance of Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam. Sayyidina wa Mawlana Abu Abdullah Al-Hussein took this eternal stance because this was the state of affairs that we just spoke about. That state of affairs that the Islamic Ummah had entered needs no further explanation. And the, the source of this obviously was disobedience of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Imam al Hussein alayhi salam knew that he needed to take this stand and he needed to create a precedent to revive Islam in that time and in all times. Forever. It was an eternal stand that the Imam made. That in fact the Imam from that time understood that he is on his way to Karbala to be martyred. There was no other option. There was nothing else that could happen. Can you speak to people that have hearts like this? Can you speak to people who give allegiance to people like Yazid ibn Muawiyah? When they tell Imam al-Hussein to give allegiance to him, he says, the likes of me would not give allegiance to the likes of him. Yazid is somebody who kills the honorable people. Qatil al-Nafs al Sharab al-Khamr. He's somebody that drinks alcohol and kills the honorable person. The likes of me does not plead allegiance to the likes of him. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is setting a precedent there. He's giving, giving us a precedent that for eternity, the people that are like this do not plead allegiance to the people that are like that. Imam al Hussein knew from the time that he went to the grave of the Holy Prophet and began, began to cry. He started crying. He held on to the grave of his grandfather and began to cry in the same actions of his father, Amir al Mu'mineen, after the loss of Fatima al Zahra. Imam Ali alayhi salam also went to the grave of the Holy Prophet and began to cry. And Imam al-Hussain alayhi salam begins to speak to his grandfather about the times and what the world has become. That he says to him that he says, inna ha, inna dunya qad wa That this world has changed and it has become, uh, it has become averse. 
it is completely flipped over. This is what the holy Imam says. I'm, I'm sorry, I've, I've really, I think I've really gone into this. Can someone remind me what time is prayer time? We've still got time? Six minutes. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Maybe we'll save this this uh, this talk of Imam Al-Hussain al for tomorrow because it's something that's it's a, it's a really b- a beautiful speech that the Imam Salam Allah Alayhi speaks about. So he says that this world has changed and it has become a verse. And then he says, وَأَدْبَرْ مَعْرُوفَهَا And the truth, the goodness in it has turned its back. That in this world there's no truth, there's no goodness in it. فَلَمْ يَبْقَى مِنْهَا إِلَّا صُبَابَةٌ قَصَابَةُ الْأَنَا that he says that the goodness has gone and the only thing that's, that's left is like the remnants of what's in the teapot or in any pouring pot that there is only small remnants this is what's left of goodness in the world he says well khasis yaish kalmar al wabil that he says and the, the vile person the villainous person lives like the uh, uh, lives the most lavish of lifestyles, and the example he uses is, is uh, uh, lush greenery. That he lives in the, the most lavish style. Uh, he, he lives the most lavish lifestyle, and then he says, "Ala taron an al la yamal bih." Do you not see that truth is not is not enacted? That 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 whatever is right is not enacted. That this is being ta- that this is something that's so great in the eyes of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Something that we see. It's so simple. Something that we even even encourage each other to do. That this is the way to rot this and this is the way to rot that and this is the way to cut around this and that. And so the Imam sits there and he speaks to his grandfather and speaks to him about what the, what the world has become. And so he asks his grandfather to take him and at this point the Imam loses consciousness. And he sees in his in, in, he sees in a vision that the Holy Prophet comes to him and he says to him that me, your grandfather and your father and your mother and your brother miss you, that we are awaiting you, and the only way you're going to get to us is through this martyrdom. That there is a, a rank that you're going to attain, and this is the only way you can attain this rank is through martyrdom. So Imam Al Hussein knows this, and although all of the companions come up to him and continually tell him that do not go to Karbala, you will know what will happen to you in Karbala. You are going to be killed in Karbala. And therefore he says to them that, that I know something that you don't know. And for some of them, he would tell them that the Holy Prophet has come to me and told me that this is, this is what I need to do. This is the stand that I need to take. That on these nights of Ashura, we remember and we cry and we beat our chests in commemoration of the stance of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. that maybe these actions that we obviously we have so many narrations about will enliven our souls and our hearts and place us back on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the way of truth. Place us back on the rail of truth that we have derailed from. As-salamu uh, alayka ya Aba Abdullah wa ala al-arwah allati hallat bi fina'ik. Alayka minni salamu Allahi abadan ma baqeet wa baqey al-layl wa al-nahar. Wa la ja'alahu Allahu akhir al-ahdi minni li ziyaratikum. As-salamu ala al-Husayn wa ala Ali ibn al-Husayn. وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين رحم الله من كرأ سورة المبارة الفاتحة وآد ثوابها إلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات تصفق الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد صلي على محمد وآل محمد